Thank you, uh, Hannah. Thanks to all of you for coming. Uh, my name is Jonathan Friedland. I'm going to be guiding the proceedings this evening. Uh, and often, you know, it, you have these cultural combat evenings where the debate is, of course, enlightening and fascinating, but rarely can it claim to be urgently topical. And yet somehow, with two novels, one written in 1931 and one written in between 1948 and 1949, you nevertheless have uh, two works that speak to us in our own time with great urgency and topicality. We, of course, are going to leave proceedings tonight knowing which one does that more than the other one. But that is the subject before us. So two dominant novels of the 20th century discussed and debated and advocated by two of the leading public intellectuals of our 21st century. So it's going to be a hugely stimulating evening. The other thing about cultural combat uh, events is that uh, they often have a different quality from the debates that uh, Intelligence Squared uh, host on this stage. Those, of course, are about the current affairs questions of our time, uh, the big political questions, whereas the cultural debate can be uh, at a more serene pace, and yet here, uh, we have two novels which speak absolutely of the questions that ordinarily we might be discussing in an evening of political debate. Two novels that uh, deal in tyranny, in technology, in memory, in conflict, in love. The big questions of our time discussed by uh, uh, and aired by two of the great writers uh, of the last century, as I said. So, the uh, debate could not be more... Uh, dramatically poised between these two great novels. And I'm going to present to you the two people who will be making the case for each of them, along with uh, a starry cast who of uh, ancillary, uh, auxiliary backup and defense for their argument. Let me hand, uh, introduce our two speakers to make these arguments. Uh, for advocating for Aldous Huxley's Brave New World is the widely acclaimed novelist, broadcaster, political commentator, and literary critic. His most recent novels are Umbrella, Shark, and Phone, a trilogy which the New Statesman predicted will become, and I quote, one of the most significant literary works of our century, books that reflect and refract the hideousness of our times. Making the case for Brave New World is Will Self, And to advocate for George Orwell's 1984 is a staff writer on The New Yorker of some time, an award-winning author, essayist, lecturer, and broadcaster. He wrote after Donald Trump's first week in office in The New Yorker about, quote, how primitive, atavistic, and uncomplicatedly brutal Trump's brand of authoritarianism is turning out to be. We have to go back to 1984, he wrote, because in effect, we have to go back to 1948 to get the flavor. He is Adam Gopnik. <laughs> and as I said, bringing in reinforcements for both our two advocates, uh, as if you like, expert witnesses are actors of great distinction who will bring to life the written word on the page here tonight uh, on our stage. Uh, please welcome first the rising star of film and television who starred as Miss Havisham in the BBC series, series Dickensian and as the Russian princess Hélène Kuragina in the recent BBC adaptation of War and Peace. A warm welcome for Tuppence Middleton. best known for playing Louis XIV in the recent TV series Versailles. He's also starred in the Oscar-winning film adaptation of Les Miserables and the series Vikings, and will appear in the forthcoming series on Netflix of Black Mirror. He is George Blagden. an actor known for his work at the Royal Shakespeare Company and whose roles in TV and film have included The West Wing, uh, The IT Crowd, Motherland, Mr. Selfridge, Hamlet, Bobby, and Sleepy Hollow. He is Orlando Seal. <laughs> and
and completing our lineup. We're delighted to say that joining us is one of the country's most celebrated stage and screen actors, uh, best with a best loved perhaps performance in films such as Four Weddings and a Funeral, A Room with a View, and Shakespeare in Love. He has also written biographies of, to great acclaim on Oscar Wilde, Orson Welles, Charles Dickens, and Richard Wagner. He is, of course, Simon Callow. So before we get fully underway and we get legal with the two advocates making the case in this uh, courtroom that we've assembled here, uh, just an opening question to each of you. Uh, let's start with you, uh, Adam, Gopnik, Adam Gopnik, and what drew you first to the man whose work you are advocating tonight, George Orwell? Uh, I read Orwell for the first time when I was 12 or 13, growing up in Canada, and I read 1984, and the descriptions of wine and sex in 1984 were hugely impressive to me as a 12-year-old. A key, I think, that there's a humane subtext in Orwell that transcends even the inhumane material. And to you, the same question, uh, Will Self, what drew you first, if you can remember your first encounter with Aldous Huxley? My childhood was, took place, Jonathan, in antique hay and chrome yellow. Until I reached adolescence, I was eyeless in Gaza. It was a brave new world once my balls dropped. <laughs> I, what can I tell you? I drank in Huxley with my mother's milk. It's an element I swim in. <laughs> I hope you've thereby setting the tone for the rest of the evening. And tonight we engage in point counterpoint. Yeah. <laughs> point counterpoint. Game for, on. Game and, on. And we'll end up hopefully on the island. Very nicely done. Uh, uh, and if you can keep up with that, then you're doing very well for the rest of the <laughs> evening. We want you to stay in that genre. Um, Excellent. So let's uh, get on with the proceedings. As you know, on your way in this evening, you will have uh, voted in, uh, uh, for a pre-vote to get a sense of your opinion, and we are going to tell you the outcome of that only after you've heard uh, the cases made. So uh, the purpose of this evening is really for you to put aside the preconceptions and prejudices you may have walked in with, and instead listen to the arguments as they're made, uh, and see if you can be moved either from the Huxley column into the Orwell column or vice versa, or, and I think you're the prized constituency this evening, if you were a don't know before, these two gentlemen here want to move you onto their side. So, first, to make his case is with, uh, I think, 25 minutes, I'm going to uh, hold you strictly to time. There may be an impolite ping of the glass from me, but here to make his case uh, is Will Self. Yes, have you left your prejudices behind? That's what I wonder. And I also would have liked you all to only have voted if you have indeed read both novels in their entirety, and hopefully fairly recently. I want to make a few preliminary remarks, because remarks at the beginning are always preliminary. <laughs> The status of uh, Orwell in our culture is such that he's earned the epithet St. George. Uh, and I doubt that very, very few people entered the Emmanuel Center this evening with a preconception about Aldous Huxley, a strong idea about who he was and what he represented. But it's almost impossible to be an adult in this country without having a very, very firm view about Orwell. And I need to deconstruct your image of Orwell a bit before I even get to the business of Brave New World, because I have a suspicion that many of you will be naturally prejudiced in Orwell's favor. But fair enough, I bow to no man or woman when it comes to admiration for George Orwell. He was an extremely fine uh, writer, journalist, and broadcaster. Uh, you may be aware that a statue of him is being installed in the uh, courtyard of New Broadcasting House almost as we speak. I think people on the right in Britain 
love George Orwell because they see him as something of a socialist turncoat who virtually on his deathbed sent in a list of some 500 fellow travelers who he believed might be sympathetic to the Soviet cause. So that's earned him the lasting love of people on the right who always pull him up as an example of a kind of good lefty who knew where to draw the line. And of course, people on the left love St. George because he was an old Etonian who went and lived down and out in Paris, wrote an anti-imperialist novel, and cleaved to a kind of English traditionalism that you see written everywhere in 1984. And if I can launch a preemptive strike against Adam Gopnik, isn't it notable how much better? He even said it himself when he said he liked the sex and the boozing in 1984. The bits in 1984 that are really good are the bits about 1948. And it's to Orwell's credit that he simply reversed the numerals in order to title his novel. Fair enough. I bow, as I say, to no man when it comes to admiration for Orwell. And indeed, I've been to Barn Hill, where he wrote 1984. In fact, I wrote myself on the island of Jura for three months, purely in order to channel the influence of George Orwell. However, when it comes to actually being prescient about the state we're in now, I'm afraid 1984 is not a terribly good guide. You have to ask yourself the simple reversal of the numerals, 1948 turned into 1984. All works of fictional prognostication, we know it's a truism, it's a pabulum, are really about their own era. So I ask you as an initial question, is 2017 more like 1948? In other words, are we a society recovering from a world war in which we face the prospect of another world war, or at any rate, some sort of deadlock between massive empires? Or are we in a condition as a country perhaps more akin to 1931? the years immediately after the stock market crash, when you saw very much the same kind of pattern of deprivation in Britain that you're seeing now in 2017, with a kind of isolated and perhaps still relatively well-off group in the southeast of the country and considerable poverty and deprivation elsewhere. So let me just park that with you, dear audience. And the other thing I want to call your attention to, having blown away the sfumato of your Orwell worship, I hope that's now gone, okay, is to say to you, audience, I always think with an audience you can always address its highest common denominator or its lowest common denominator. You can either make fart jokes and allude to things that juvenile people find funny or you can try and hit the highest common denominator and make some serious and important arguments. Well, judging from the ticket price for this event, <laughs> a subject I will return to later, <laughs> judging from its location, judging from your marvelously soigné appearance this evening, I think it's probably best to go for the highest common denominator. Because I suspect that you are all alphas. And at, at worst, beta pluses. <laughs> I don't think there are many epsilon semi-morons in the audience tonight at all. So tell me, alphas of London, are you suffering a life of constant deprivation at the moment, only drinking bathtub gin that stinks and trying to light cigarettes where the tobacco is so dry that they fall out of them as they, you raise them to your lips, or are your lives in fact characterized 
by instant gratification, usually by consumption of one sort or another. <laughs> Hold that thought while these marvelous actors give us our first extract from the sublime Brave New World. Observe, said the director triumphantly, observe books and loud noises, flowers and electric shocks. Already in the infant mind, these couples are compromisingly linked. And after 200 repetitions of the same, or a similar lesson, will be wedded indissolubly. What man has joined, nature is powerless to put asunder. They'll grow up with what the psychologists used to call an instinctive hatred of books and flowers. Reflexes unalterably conditioned. They'll be safe from books and botany all their lives. One of the students held up his hand. Though I can see quite well why you can't have lower caste people wasting the community's time over books, and that there is always the risk of their reading something which might undesirably decondition one of their reflexes, yet, well, I can't understand about the flowers. Why go to the trouble of making it psychologically impossible for deltas to like flowers? Patiently, the DHC explained. If the children were made to scream at the sight of a rose, that was on grounds of high economic policy. Not so very long ago, a century or thereabouts, gammas, deltas, even epsilons, had been conditioned to like flowers. Flowers in particular, and wild nature in general. The idea was to make them want to be going out into the country at every available opportunity, and so compel them to consume transport. And didn't they consume transport? Asked the student. Quite a lot. The DHC replied. But nothing else. Promises, primroses and landscapes have one grave defect. They are gratuitous. A love of nature keeps no factories busy. It was decided to abolish the love of nature, at any rate among the lower classes. To abolish the love of nature, but not the tendency to consume transport. Because it was essential that they should keep on going to the country, even though they hated it. The problem was to find an economically sounder reason for consuming transport than a mere affection for primroses and landscapes. It was duly found. We conditioned the masses to hate the country, concluded the director. But simultaneously, we conditioned them to love all country sports. At the same time, we see to it that all country sports shall entail the use of elaborate apparatus so that they consume manufactured articles as well as transport. Hence those electric shocks. I see, said the student, and was silent, lost in admiration. I hope everybody's got their phone on airport or whatever it is mode because if you didn't have it on airport mode, you might receive a little electric shock during the event, yeah? So recent studies in cognitive science establish that you get a little jolt of dopamine every time you get an alert on your mobile phone, every time you push a button on it or a, cons or a computer console, you are rewarded. There is a pleasurable sensation. You will have noticed in the flow of your screen-mediated lives that there are a myriad of these little electric shocks going on throughout your day. The only difference between you and the children in Brave New World who are conditioned to hate flowers and beautiful things and books in that way is that your conditioning is happening while you're wide awake. Or are you? Is the current lifestyle of the consumer in fact a kind of waking dream? 
what Huxley understands only too well is conditions under what we might call late capitalism. In other words, the kind of neoliberal capitalist societies we live in now. What Huxley understood only too well was that in an economy that is defined by consumption and advertising is the form of behavioral conditioning, everybody will be perfectly pacific as long as their needs and their wants are conflated in their own minds. That is very much the world we're living in. You don't need to be a Marxist to understand that you're a commodity fetishist. You don't need to feel that you've been conditioned to be conditioned. I think that's the real genius of the dystopic future that Huxley summons up in Brave New World. There's no strife, there's no angst. The only angst has to be introduced by an agonist in the form of the savage who comes from outside the perfect and hermetic world of the one state. Orwell's dystopic future is so clearly based on the command economy of the Soviet Union. There's no real reference to production or how things are made. But in Huxley's world, the combination, it's true that what he looked for in terms of technological advance was most clearly in the biological sciences. But think about it. The conjunction in Brave New World of large-scale genetic engineering and assembly line production equals the automation that is currently making most of the people in this hall tonight effectively unemployed in that we do not actually contribute to our own necessities. We do really useless jobs, none more useless than Adam and me. <laughs> Orwell didn't grasp any of that. Orwell didn't purpose his dystopia in mind of the economic realities. His was a political attack, a deliberate political attack. But Huxley, understood the real economic terms of existence under late capitalism. And Huxley had the vision because he understood that the key determinant of the nature of the future would be humankind's ongoing relationship with technology to fashion a portrait of a dystopic future which, while not exactly like the world we're living in, has so many of the same lineaments, it's uncanny. Let's have the second extract. How much I love you, Lenina. He brought out almost desperately. An emblem of the inner tide of startled elation, the blood rushed up into Lenina's cheeks. Do you mean it, John? But I hadn't mean to say so cried the savage, clasping his hands in a kind of agony. Not until... Listen, Lenina, in Malpais, people get married. Get what? The irritation had begun to creep back into her voice. What was he talking about now? For always. They make a promise to live together for always. <laughs> what a horrible idea. <laughs> Lenina was genuinely shocked. Outliving beauties outward with a mind that doth renew swifter than blood decays. What? It's like that in Shakespeare, too. If thou dost break her virgin knot before, all sanctimonious ceremonies may with full and holy right. For Ford's sake, John, talk sense. I can't understand a word you say. If I didn't like you so much, I'd be furious with you. And suddenly her arms were round his neck. He felt her lips soft against his own, so deliciously soft, so warm and electric, that inevitably he found himself thinking of the embraces in three weeks in a helicopter. Ooh, ooh, the stereoscopic blonde, and ah, the more the real blackamoor. Horror, horror, horror. 
He tried to disengage himself, but Lenina tightened her embrace. If you loved me, why didn't you say so? She whispered, drawing back her face to look at him. Her eyes were tenderly reproachful. The murkiest den at the most opportune place. The voice of conscience thundered poetically. The strongest suggestion our worser genius can shall never melt mine honor into lust. Never, never. He resolved. You silly boy. She was saying. I wanted you so much. And if you wanted me too, why didn't you? But Lenina. He began protesting. And as she immediately untwined her arms, as she stepped away from him, he thought for a moment that she had taken his unspoken hint. But when she unbuckled her white patent cartridge belt and hung it carefully over the back of a chair, he began to suspect that he had been mistaken. Lenina, he repeated apprehensively. She put her hand to her neck and gave a long vertical pull. Her white sailor's blouse was ripped to the hem. Suspicion condensed into a too, too solid certainty. Lenina, what are you doing? Zip, zip. Her answer was wordless. She stepped out of her bell-bottomed trousers. Her zippy cami nicks were a pale shell pink. The arch community songster's golden tea dangled at her breast. For those milk paps that through the window bars bore at men's eyes. The singing, thundering, magical words made her seem doubly dangerous, doubly alluring. Soft, soft, but how piercing. Boring and drilling into reason, tunneling through resolution. The strongest oaths are straw to the fire in the blood. Be more abstemious or, or, or else zip. The rounded pinkness fell apart like a neatly divided apple. A wriggle of the arms, a lifting first of the right foot, then the left. The zippy cami nicks were lying lifeless and as though deflated on the floor. Still wearing her shoes and socks and her rakishly tilted round white cap, she advanced towards him. Darling, darling, if only you'd said so before. She held out her arms, but instead of also saying, darling, and holding out his arms, the savage retreated in terror, flapping his hands at her as though he were trying to scare away some intruding and dangerous animal. Four backward steps, and he was brought to bay against the wall. Sweet, said Lenina, and laying her hands on his shoulders, pressed herself against him. Put your arms around me, she commanded. Hug me till you drug me, honey. She, too, had poetry at her command. <laughs> New words that sang and were spells and beat drums. Kiss me. She closed her eyes. She let her voice sink to a sleepy murmur. Kiss me till I'm in a coma. Hug me, honey, snuggly. The savage caught her by the wrists, tore her hands from his shoulders, and thrust her roughly away at arm's length. Well, it may be cast in a different light. It may be focused in this scene uh, in the form of the savage John's rejection of Lenina, who is a kind of properly promiscuous member of the one state, whereas he is stuck in this antediluvian mindset where he believes in fidelity and monogamy. And you may well be sitting there thinking, really? How can this be a picture of the kind of sexual politics and reality of our own era? But I think it is. I really think it is. Just consider, Huxley was writing in 1931 before the contraceptive pill, but he anticipates its role in the one state. There's nothing like it, of course, in 1984. Huxley anticipates, of course, genetic engineering, something that we now have, something, incidentally, that's keeping me alive since I take uh, medication that kills stem cells. So I'm well aware of the existence of that. And you may think, 
the idea that Huxley puts into Brave New World, whereby in the one state it's mandatory to be promiscuous, it's mandatory to share yourself with other people sexually, doesn't really apply to the world we're in. You may particularly feel it doesn't apply to you, for example, if you're sexually frustrated right now. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, you can get that little electronic shock device that you have in your pocket out, and you can switch it off air, airplane mode, and within milliseconds, you can be looking at a variety and intensity of pornography the world has never seen the like of. The quantity of pornographic imagery on the World Wide Web is simply phenomenal. Again, back to cognitive science. I'm going to talk a bit more after the next extract about the two visions of war and peace in 1984 and Brave New World. In Brave New World, permanent peace. In 1984, permanent war. But what's significant here is that research shows that people who are watching internet pornography or engaging in internet pornography are experiencing at the level of brain chemistry the same thing as people who are actually having sex. So our indulgence, and I'm sure you're sitting there thinking, it doesn't apply to me, I never look at pornography. But nonetheless, you sense its great seething, pullulating morass behind the screen. You know it's there. And that is a kind of mass collective promiscuity. But even so, you know, in the years since 1931, we have gone into a much, much more promiscuous, much whether it's serial monogamy or actual polygamy of one form or another, we do live in an increasingly singleton society. The number of single households goes up and up and up. And again, this is something that we don't really see anything of in 1984, because apart from helicopters, speak right machines, and the ubiquitous screens in 1984, there is no allusion to technology whatsoever. Back to the Genetic engineering of the different groups in 1984 or the, in Brave New World or the different classes. Are you alphas so confident you're not living in a world that actually does have deltas and epsilon semi-morons? Stick around after the event and have a chat with some of the people who are cleaning this hall before you go home people who are probably going back to zone four, people who may well be in the black or gray economy or certainly on minimum wage. They're among us, the epsilons and deltas of Brave New World. But the thing about us alphas is we've always got the feelies and the stereoscopic movies. We've always got a virtual reality to hand, usually right in our pocket in order to evade our realization of that. It's not an enviable task telling an audience that they're living in a dystopia. It's a dirty job. Somebody has to do it. <laughs> Here's the third extract. But God's the reason for everything noble and fine and heroic. If you had a god... My dear young friend... Said Mustafa Mond. Civilization has absolutely no need of nobility or heroism. These things are symptoms of political inefficiency. In a properly organized society like ours, nobody has any opportunities for being noble or heroic. Conditions have got to be thoroughly unstable before the occasion can arise. Where there are wars, where there are divided allegiances, where there are temptations to be resisted, objects of love to be fought for or defended, there, obviously, nobility and heroism have some sense. But there aren't any wars nowadays. The greatest care is taken to prevent you from loving anyone too much. 
There's no such thing as a divided allegiance. You're so conditioned that you can't help doing what you ought to do. And what you ought to do is on the whole so pleasant, so many of the natural impulses are allowed free play, that there really aren't any temptations to resist. And if ever, by some unlucky chance, anything unpleasant should somehow happen, why, there's always Soma to give you a holiday from the facts. There's always Soma to calm your anger, to reconcile you to your enemies, to make you patient, long-suffering. In the past, you could only accomplish these things by making a great effort, and after years of hard moral training, now you swallow two or three half-gram tablets, and there you are. Anybody can be virtuous now. You can carry at least half your morality about in a bottle. Christianity without tears. That's what Soma is. But the tears are necessary. Don't you remember what Othello said? If after every tempest came such calms, may the winds blow till they have weakened death. There's a story one of the old Indians used to tell us about the girl of Mataski. The young men who wanted to marry her had to do a morning's hoeing in her garden. It seemed easy, but there were flies and mosquitoes, magic ones. Most of the young men simply couldn't stand the biting and stinging, but the one that could, he got the girl. Charming. But in civilized countries, said the controller, you can have girls without hoeing for them. And there aren't any flies or mosquitoes to sting you. We got rid of them all centuries ago. The savage nodded, frowning. You got rid of them. Yes, that's just like you. Getting rid of everything unpleasant instead of learning to put up with it. Whether it is better in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune or to take arms against a sea of troubles and by opposing, end them. But you don't do either. Neither suffer nor oppose. You just abolish the slings and arrows. It's too easy. What you need, the savage went on, is something with tears for a change. Nothing costs enough here. Exposing what is mortal and unsure to all that fortune, death and danger, dare, even for an eggshell. Isn't there something in that? He asked, looking up at Mustafa Mond. Quite apart from God, though of course God would be a reason for it. Isn't there something in living dangerously? I've got to be quick. We're under the gun. You're all on Soma. Or quite a lot of you are. 11 million prescriptions for selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors written in the last year in the UK. Statistically, at least 10% of this audience is on some kind of mood-altering drugs as I speak to you. Orwell didn't spot that one coming. <laughs> Aldous did. And not just uh, things like Prozac and Siroxac, but the Oxycontin plague uh, epidemic in America at the moment, coming soon to a doctor's surgery near you. Prozac to get it up. Zoplicon to make it lie down again. I shouldn't imagine there's actually anybody in this room that hasn't got some chemical in their system at the moment. Antibiotics, they're a form of soma too. Really, they are. You live your lives in a kind of amniotic fluid of drugs. Orwell didn't see that, he's just got his lousy victory gin. But Huxley understood that technology is imminent in human being and that it determines the historical eras we live through. Permanent war versus no war. Some might like to argue that we are still in an extended version of superpower conflict of some kind or another. Or certainly that the idea of permanent peace is ridiculous when we look at the mayhem all around us in the world. But get this, where you alphas are sitting right now, it's permanent peace. None of you have seen the least conflict in your lifetimes if you've been sitting here in zone one and two. Conflict goes on somewhere else. You watch it on your stereoscopic movies or your feelies and your brain chemistry, if you're an aggressive young man, makes you 
effectively experience the same thing as if you had inflicted violence. Huxley understood that this was the brave new world that was coming, a world in which young men sit in upstairs bedrooms pretending to kill and slaughter thousands, or a world in which five million people have died in the Congo in the last 15 or 20 years, so you can have that mobile phone in your pocket with its coltan in it. War for us nowadays is a spectacle that takes place in another country. Since 9-11, what? Maybe half a million people have died in the Middle East, five million people have been displaced, failed states in Iraq, Syria, the Lebanon, Yemen. But it's really peaceful here in our newfound land, isn't it? That conflict doesn't really disturb our sense of civic peace. It's something going on, it's noises off for us. Again, I think Huxley understood that kind of world. He understood how a world of consumption and conditioning and advertising could insulate people from the reality and the real terms of their existence. I urge you, I urge you <laughs> to give Brave New World your vote. Thank you. Thank you. So, oh, no, he, no more. He understood it was an anthropic world okay, as well. No. You got the bit about killing all the flies. Okay, we got that. Good. <laughs> um, so, in, in this combat in the language of sports, uh, Will Self has taken it to the opposition there, sticking it to 1984, making the case that Aldous Huxley and Brave New World anticipates the world we live in today, late capitalism, consumerism, uh, antidepressants, genetic engineering, pornography, and says 1984 is just a political screed against uh, Soviet-style communism. So the challenge is laid down here to pick it up uh, and make the opposing case for 1984, Adam Gopnik. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Will. Thank you, players. Um, Will, I too was once a Huxleyan. I too once thought that Huxley's vision was the one that was dominant, that would indeed be triumphant in our time. As recently as the turn of the millennium, I think most of us felt that way. It seemed that we had entered into a realm in which, some of you may recall this, history had ended, in which a model of materialist pleasure, in which the blind pursuit of technological progress was all that would preoccupy mankind. It might have been even a time when the thing that most preoccupied us was the possibility that there would be wildly erotic women who failed to rise to our standards of Shakespearean drama. But that is not the time we live in now. Not the time we live in now at all. In the last few years, in the last decade, in the last five years, and certainly for those of us who live in America in the past year, we've become aware of the ongoing cogency and necessity of Orwell's vision. The two visions we're looking at tonight can be, I think, simply encapsulated. Huxley showed us a vision of the future in which we would enslave ourselves through the blind pursuit of pleasure. And Orwell showed us a vision of the world in which we would be enslaved by those in blind pursuit of power. And I ask you if the history of recent times doesn't suggest more powerfully that that second, darker vision is not now in the ascendancy, shockingly in the, in the ascendancy, startlingly perhaps in the ascendancy, but with Putin and Russia, with the waves of right-wing nationalism running through Europe, and yes, above all, with the rise of Trumpism in America, we see the brute realities of Orwell's vision of power. Forget for a moment all the parts of 1984 that are indeed, as Will rightly said, taken from Britain in 1948, the bad meat and the bad bread of the BBC cafeteria. See past that for a moment. See past Orwell's attempt to allegorize Soviet Union and Stalinism and sp spread it into the future. That's not the core of Orwell's vision. That's not what makes 1984 matter now. 
No, what Orwell saw was that there would be three principal ways in which power would propagate itself and enslave free men and women. First, through the corruption of thought, through the compression of language. Not merely by reducing the means of argument, not merely by reducing things that there are to argue about, as we find in Huxley's homogenized and sedated, pleasure-satiated world. No, Orwell saw that we could make it impossible for rational speech to be heard at all, for language and argument to take place simply by altering the means with which we communicate. Second, Orwell saw that power would be able to propagate and extend itself through the perpetual creation of an evil other. It didn't even matter what the other was. First, we were always at war with East Asia, and then always at war with Eurasia. At any moment, an other has to be created that can become a focus of hatred and blind us to the realities of power and the state. And third and finally, Orwell anticipated far more cogently even than he projected forward the ideology of the Soviet state into the future, Orwell anticipated the possibility of an autocracy, of a form of totalitarianism that had no connection at all to any utopian vision, Marxist or materialist, whatever, no relation at all to a positive vision of the future, however distorted or warped it might have become, no, Orwell saw that the evil of the future would be an evil that would be rooted in an appetite for power and a desire to perpetuate power in the hands of a small inner party, of an oligarchy, if you like, of a kleptocracy, if you like, whose only end was simply to perpetually gain more power and inflict more pain to keep it. I want you to think about those three central pillars of Orwell's vision when you consider which book to turn to tonight. The first one, the question of language and thought, Orwell's great preoccupation. How it is that simply by altering the means, the instrument of language with which we must articulate our vision of the world and our argument for liberty, by altering language, we can reshape thought. Here's the first instance of that as Orwell pictures it in an exchange in the cafeteria. It's a beautiful thing, the destruction of words. Of course, the great wastage is in the verbs and adjectives. There are hundreds of nouns that can be got rid of as well. It isn't only the synonyms, there are also the antonyms. After all, what justification is there for a word which is simply the opposite of some other word? A word contains its opposite in itself. Take good, for instance. If you have a word like good, what need is there for a word like bad? Ungood will do just as well. Better, because it's an exact opposite, which the other is not. Or again, if, if you want a stronger version of good, what sense is there in having a whole string of vague, useless words like excellent and splendid and all the rest of them? Plus good covers the meaning. Or double plus good if you want something stronger still. Of course, we use those forms already, but in the final version of Newspeak, there'll be nothing else. In the end, the whole notion of goodness and badness will be covered by only six words. In reality, only one word. Don't you see the beauty of that? Winston, it was Big Brother's idea originally, of course. He added as an afterthought. A sort of vapid eagerness flitted across Winston's face at the mention of Big Brother. Nevertheless, Syme immediately detected a certain lack of enthusiasm. You haven't a real appreciation of Newspeak, Winston. He said almost sadly. Even when you write it, you're still thinking in old speak. I, I've read some of those pieces that you write it, it, in, in the Times occasionally. They're good enough, but they're translations. In your heart, you'd prefer to stick to old speak, with all its vagueness and its useless shades of meaning. You don't grasp the beauty of the destruction of words. Do you know that new speak is the only language in the world whose vocabulary gets smaller every year? 
Winston did know that, of course. He smiled, sympathetically, he hoped, not trusting himself to speak. Syme bit off another fragment of the dark-coloured bread, chewed it briefly and went on. Don't you see that the whole aim of Newspeak is to narrow the range of thought? In the end, we shall make thought crime literally impossible because there will be no words in which to express it. Every concept that can ever be needed will be expressed by exactly one word with its meaning rigidly defined and all its subsidiary meanings rubbed out and forgotten. Already in the 11th edition, we're not far from that point. The process will still be continuing long after you and I are dead. Every year, fewer and fewer words and the range of consciousness always a little smaller. Even now, of course, there's no reason or excuse for committing thought crime. It, it, it's merely a question of self-discipline, reality control. But in the end, there won't be any need even for that. The revolution will be complete when the language is perfect. Newspeak is Ingsoc, and Ingsoc is Newspeak. He added with a sort of mystical satisfaction. Did it ever occur to you, Winston, that by the year 2050, at the very latest, not a single human being will be alive who could understand such a conversation as we are having now? Well, except... Began Winston doubtfully, and he stopped. It had been on the tip of his tongue to say... Except the proles. But he checked himself, not feeling fully certain that this remark was not in some way unorthodox. Syme, however, had divined what he was about to say. The proles are not human beings, he said carelessly. By 2050, earlier probably, all real knowledge of old speak will have disappeared. The whole literature of the past will have been destroyed. Chaucer, Shakespeare, Milton, Byron, they'll only exist in new speak versions not merely changed into something different, but actually changed into something contradictory of what they used to be. Even the literature of the party will change. Even the slogans will change. How could you have a slogan like, freedom is slavery, when the concept of freedom has been abolished? The whole climate of thought will be different. In fact, there will be no thought as we understand it now. Orthodoxy means not thinking, not needing to think. Orthodoxy is unconsciousness. Well, orthodoxy is unconsciousness. The end of Newspeak is to deprive us of the possibility of argument, not merely to out-argue us, but to deprive us of that possibility. Now, Orwell made one error looking into the future, perhaps. He thought that that act of fatal compression would happen through the elimination of lexical elements, of words. It isn't what we've seen, precisely, is it? What we've seen is that you can achieve the same power of thought control, of the compression of language, and with it the elimination of argument, through the compression of speech. We live in an age of social media, in Twitter, in which we've seen, in the most frightening possible way, that the only people who can manipulate those means effectively are those with an autocratic or an authoritarian vision. You may have heard of a leading politician in the country from which I flew last night who uses Twitter exclusively as his means of communication exactly because in the limited number of characters that are allowed to the speaker of Twitter, our own newspeak, it's impossible to have what's essential to liberal democracy, a developed argument. A first this premise and then this evidence and then this revision. No, all you can do is make authoritarian assertion. And all you can do in return is make a counter-assertion, and in the act of making that counter-assertion, you yourself subscribe, necessarily, to the nature of authoritarian discourse. There's no way you can have an extended, reasoned argument on Twitter. You can merely have a shouting match. That's exactly what Orwell understood about the way that the corruption of language leads to the impossibility of real political argument. The second thing that Orwell understood and that he projects forward to us through past all 
of the specific details of 1984. The second thing he understood was the power of hatred and more subtly, even more potently, the way that the power of hatred depends on the manipulation of memory. We always have to have another to hate, whether it's uh, East Asia, Eurasia, Islam, the bad hombres coming across from Mexico. It's essential to the authoritarian imagination that everyone, those proles, those epsilons of whom Will speaks, are focused on the threatening other and not on the powers that be, not on the structure of power. And that's only possible, Orwell understood, if the past itself becomes meaningless. We can only constantly move the object of our rage and our fear effectively if we no longer have a regular and reliable grasp on our own history. At one moment in 1984, you'll recall, Winston is sure that he's seen one potent piece of newspaper that has a photograph of three purged inner party members who are now non-persons, now never existed at all. And he's convinced that if he can only share this information, this simple fact that there was a past, things actually happened in one way and not in any way that authority decrees, if he can hold on to that, then he can hold on to his sanity and to his sense of his inner self. But even with his beloved Julia, the woman for whom he has risked everything, he can't convey how essential it is to have a secure grasp of what happened once. Sometimes he talked to her of the records department and the impudent forgeries that he committed there. Such things did not appear to horrify her. She did not feel the abyss opening beneath her feet at the thought of lies becoming truths. He told her the story of Jones, Aronson and Rutherford and the momentous slip of paper which he had once held between his fingers. It did not make much impression on her. At first, indeed, she failed to grasp the point of the story. Were they friends of yours? She said. No, I never knew them. They were inner party members. Besides, they were far older men than I was. They belonged to the old days, before the revolution. I barely knew them by sight. Then what was there to worry about? People are being killed off all the time, aren't they? He tried to make her understand. This was an exceptional case. It wasn't just a question of somebody being killed. Do you realize that the past, starting from yesterday, has been actually abolished? If it survives anywhere, it's in a few solid objects with no words attached to them, like that lump of glass there. Already we know almost literally nothing about the revolution and the years before the revolution. Every record has been destroyed or falsified. Every book has been rewritten, every picture has been repainted, every statue and street and building has been renamed, every date has been altered. And that process is continuing day by day and minute by minute. History has stopped. Nothing exists except an endless present in which the party is always right. I know, of course, that the past is falsified, but it would never be possible for me to prove it, even when I did the falsification myself. After the thing is done, no evidence ever remains. The only evidence is inside my own mind. And I don't know with any certainty that any other human being shares my memories. Just in that one instance, in my whole life, I did possess actual concrete evidence after the event, years after it. And what good was that? It was no good, because I threw it away a few minutes later. But if the same thing happened today, I should keep it. Well, I wouldn't, said Julia. I'm quite ready to take risks, but only for something worthwhile, not bits of old newspaper. What could you have done with it, even if you had kept it? Not much, perhaps, but it was evidence. It might have planted a few doubts here and there, supposing that I dared to show it to anybody. I don't imagine that we can alter anything in our own lifetime, but one can imagine little knots of resistance springing up here and there. Small groups of people banding themselves together and gradually growing and even leaving a few records behind so that the next generations can carry on where we leave off. I'm not interested in the next generation, dear. 
I'm interested in us. You're only a rebel from the waist downwards. <laughs> Think of how the wave of autocracy, the wave of renewed authoritarianism that's sweeping through the world right now, how it reasons. Think about how fragile our grasp on the past becomes. In France, the country where I lived for many years, the National Front goes about making 1940 hard to recuperate in its reality. Uh, in Russia, we've seen how Putinism makes the actuality of the hundred years between the revolution and today always um, up in the air, again, loses its essential hold on what really happened. In our own country, in the United States of America, things that happened a mere eight months ago, the number of people who were at Trump's inauguration, the number of votes cast for Hillary Clinton or for Trump, are thrown up in the air and we're told that they're undecidable. We're told that there are two sides to a story in which, in reality, there is only one side, but our ability to grasp and assert that truth is as fragile as Winston's piece of newspaper with the three inner party members on it. Another way in which the totalitarian mind works and is working now is through uh, simple brute power. Will is absolutely right to point to what's happening in the Congo or in Africa or everywhere else, not through Huxley's imagined pursuit of pleasure and elimination of strife and difficulty, all the Shakespearean emotions. No, the world is ruled now, as it was in Orwell's time, by brute power, because brute power alone can make us change our simple grasp of arithmetic. How can you stop people remembering things? Cried Winston, momentarily forgetting the dial. It is involuntary. It is outside oneself. How can you control memory? You've not controlled mine. O'Brien's manner grew stern again. He laid his hand on the dial. On the contrary, he said. You have not controlled it. That is what has brought you here. You are here because you have failed in humility, in self-discipline. You would not make the act of submission, which is the price of sanity. You preferred to be a lunatic, a minority of one. Only the disciplined mind can see reality, Winston. You believe that reality is something objective, external, existing in its own right. You also believe that the nature of reality is self-evident. When you delude yourself into thinking that you see something, you assume that everyone else sees the same thing as you. But I tell you, Winston, that everyone else sees the same thing, that reality is not external. Reality exists in the human mind, and nowhere else. Not in the individual mind, which can make mistakes, and in any case soon perishes. Only in the mind of the party, which is collective, and immortal. Whatever the party holds to be the truth is truth. It is impossible to see reality except by looking through the eyes of the party. That is the fact you have got to relearn, Winston. It needs an act of self-destruction, an effort of the will. You must humble yourself before you can become sane. He paused for a few moments as though to allow what he had been saying to sink in. You remember, he went on, writing in your diary, freedom is the freedom to say that two plus two make four? Yes, said Winston. O'Brien held up his left hand, its back towards Winston, with the thumb hidden and the four fingers extended. How many fingers am I holding up, Winston? Four. And if the party says that it is not four, but five, then how many? Four. The word ended in a gasp of pain. The needle of the dial had shot up to 55. The sweat had sprung out all over Winston's body. 
the air tore into his lungs and issued again in deep groans, which even by clenching his teeth he could not stop. O'Brien watched him, the four fingers still extended. He drew back the lever. This time the pain was only slightly eased. How many fingers, Winston? Four. The needle went up to sixty. How many fingers, Winston? Four. Four. What else can I say? Four. The needle must have risen again, but he didn't look at it. The heavy, stern face and the four fingers filled his vision. The fingers stood up before his eyes like pillars, enormous, blurry, and seemed to vibrate, but unmistakably four. How many fingers, Winston? Four! Stop it! Stop it! How can you go on? Four! Four! How many fingers, Winston? Five! 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 No, Winston, that is no use. You are lying. You still think there are four. How many fingers, please? Four, five, four, a anything you like, only stop it, stop the pain. Abruptly, he was sitting up with O'Brien's arm round his shoulders. He had perhaps lost consciousness for a few seconds. The bonds that held his body down were loosened. He felt very cold. He was shaking uncontrollably. His teeth were chattering. The tears were rolling down his cheeks. For a moment, he clung to O'Brien like a baby, curiously comforted by the heavy arm round his shoulders. He had the feeling that O'Brien was his protector, that the pain was something that came from outside, from some other source, and that it was O'Brien who would save him from it. You are a slow learner, Winston, said O'Brien gently. How can I help it? He blubbered. How, how can I help seeing what is in front of my eyes? Two and two are four. Sometimes, Winston, sometimes they are five, sometimes they are three, sometimes they are all of them at once. You must try harder. It is not easy to become sane. All over the world, scenes like the one that we just dramatized from Orwell are taking place. That's how power still asserts itself. Yes, we're lucky here tonight in this London meeting room. We're not likely to be taken to room 101 tonight. But all around the world, far more people are being hauled into the rooms 101 of autocracies and tyrannies of all kind than are being eject injected with uh, an elating soma that brings them up. And one last thing that Orwell understood presciently, prophetically, even beyond his understanding of the nature of the Stalinist tyranny, he understood that finally power is there for its own sake. And if there is a single chilling truth about the 21st century is that we've seen in Putinism, in Russia, in Trumpism in America, an ideology of authoritarianism that no longer relies even, even on the vision, even on the lie of an improved world, that simply asserts itself as brutal domination for domination's sake. That was stupid, Winston. Stupid, he said. You should know better than to say a thing like that. He pulled the lever back and continued. Now I will tell you the answer to my question. It is this. The party seeks power entirely for its own sake. We are not interested in the good of others. We are interested solely in power. Not wealth or luxury or long life or happiness. Only power. Pure power. What pure power means, you will understand presently. We are different from all the oligarchies of the past in that we know what we are doing. All the others, even those who resembled ourselves, were cowards and hypocrites. The German Nazis and the Russian communists came very close to us in their methods, but they never had the courage to recognize their own motives. They pretended Perhaps they even believed that they had seized power unwillingly and for a limited time. And that just round the corner, 
there lay a paradise where human beings would be free and equal. We are not like that. We know that no one ever seizes power with the intention of relinquishing it. Power is not a means. It is an end. One does not establish a dictatorship in order to safeguard a revolution. One establishes, makes the revolution in order to establish the dictatorship. The object of persecution is persecution. The object of torture is torture. The object of power is power. Now do you begin to understand me? O'Brien leaned over him, deliberately bringing the worn face nearer. Power over matter. External reality, as you would call it, is not important. Already our control over matter is absolute. The real power, the power we have to fight for night and day, is not power over things, but over men. He paused, and for a moment assumed again his air of a schoolmaster questioning a promising pupil. How does one man assert his power over another, Winston? Winston thought. By making him suffer, he said. Exactly. By making him suffer. Obedience is not enough. Unless he is suffering, how can you be sure that he is obeying your will and not his own? Power is in inflicting pain and humiliation. Power is in tearing human minds to pieces and putting them together again in new shapes of your own choosing. You begin to see then what kind of a world we are creating. It is the exact opposite of the stupid hedonistic utopias that the old reformers imagined. A world of fear and treachery is torment. A world of trampling and being trampled upon. A world which will grow not less, but more merciless as it refines itself. Progress in our world will be progress towards more pain. The old civilizations claimed that they were founded on love or justice. Ours is founded upon hatred. In our world, there will be no emotions except fear, Rage, triumph, and self-abasement. Everything else we shall destroy. Everything. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, would that Huxley's vision which Will has so ably advocated for tonight, was the truth of our time. Would that the blind pursuit of material pleasure was leading us to a hedonistic utopia where pain and strife were no longer available to us? I ask you if that's the world you see at this moment when a wave of authoritarianism is sweeping across the planet. Or if you do not see, as I do as an emissary from a country where it is in the midst of happening, a new ideology in which power and pain perpetuate themselves for their own sake over and over. And I ask you if that is not the core of Orwell's vision and if it is not the horrifying truth of our time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, thanks. Thanks to both our speakers for such uh, powerful advocacy of these two remarkable novels. As you know, before you came in, you did uh, have a little vote, a straw poll, which gave us some sense of the room. Uh, and let me just tell you now the outcome of that vote, which uh, obviously may have moved uh, through the power and rhetoric we've just heard. Before, as you came in, the number of people who voted for Brave New World as the most prescient novel of our time was 35%. The number who cast their votes for 1984 was 41%.
and there were 24% who were don't knows. So that's how things stood uh, before we all came in. We're going to have just a very short discussion here, but, um, uh, and then we're going to open it up for questions. And in a few moments' time, uh, there'll be a chance to cast your votes anew. I want to put to each of you, in a way that, I mean, you made so many strong points, but one of your strongest points each to, to each side. And first of all, starting with you, uh, Will Self. You're a writer. You uh, know and value the importance of language. The point Adam Gopnik made was that how central the control of language is in 1984, and surely a sign of its resonance in our own time is the fact that this novel, uh, 70 years on, has shaped so much of our vocabulary today. So to this day, we still speak of thought crime, room 101, big brother, double think, non-person. The list goes on. Surely that itself shows you the power of this novel and how prescient and resonant it is for our time. Yes, and, and what do we use Room 101 and Big Brother to refer to? Television programs. <laughs> I just ask you, you know, Big Brother stands at the center of 1984, Ford stands at the center of Brave New World, and Ford symbolizes all of the multinational corporations who are smuggling away and not declaring their tax, not paying their taxes, and who are selling to you yeah, it's not a pleasurable utopia for most of the world, but I ask you, are you going to leave this hall and in the next few weeks indulge in collective hate ceremonies, or are you going to have a drugged-up solidarity ceremony in which you collectively spunk off millions of pounds on consumer goods you don't need? <laughs> I think probably the latter. And in answer to Adam's point about the control of language and Twitter, he's got it completely wrong. That's not language. Language isn't being impoverished. That's a mediatized discourse and a commoditized discourse. And again, it's a function of Huxley's vision of a world dominated by technology. Thank you. Um, the uh, the uh, chance to cast your vote anew is already happening. We're quick on the uh, update here. And so the way you're going to vote, as you hear these closing arguments, is using your ballot paper here. There's a very convenient little perforated edge. Just uh, break that apart and put in uh, to the ballot box whichever novel you feel is the one more prescient for our time. But Adam, got me, you can come back on that point there about language, <laughs> but I also wanted to put to you the, th the, the elements of our world that Will self-emphasized in his opening presentation j j that form such a part of our world from consumerism, uh, antidepressant drugs, pornography, contraception, genetic engineering. There were so many technological innovations that, albeit sitting in 1931, Aldous Huxley did seem to preempt. He may not have given us quite the vocabulary that 1984 did, but he does seem to anticipate so many of the things that shape our world. There's no question, Brave New World is an extraordinary, prescient, and, and in every way remarkable novel. Uh, as I said at the beginning of my re remarks tonight, the striking thing is that as recently as the millennium, I would have taken Will's side and I would have agreed with him. I would have, I would have grabbed that. I think that, as a great man said once, when the world changes, our, when the facts change, our views have to change. And it seems to me that the facts have changed in the most dramatic possible way in the last decade, the last five years, the last one year, uh, and have reminded us that exactly the world in which we thought we were living, this matrix of pleasure and hedonism, is not the world in which we are actually living. The world in which we're actually living is one in which uh, power is uh, asserting itself in the most brutal imaginable way, everywhere from Moscow to uh, New York City. And the conditions of the world have changed, and our understanding of literature has to change with it. To your point, Will, which I think is a, is a reasonable one, that Twitter, far from being newspeak, in fact, is a, an extension of technology and is, is Huxley and commoditization. And, and commoditization is true. What no one foresaw properly when Twitter first came forward is that the finest tweeters would be, uh, would be authoritarian tyrants. Everyone thought it would be a great cocktail party in which all would share, and it turns out to be a big fascist meeting in which one big boss tweets out his rule, his assertion of the day, including wildly false and fake assertions and of it. And you feel that's inherent in the medium because it only allows for brief assertion rather than elaborate and complex Yes, how do, you come, how do you come back 
at a, an, an authoritarian assertion. All you can have, as I said, is a counter assertion. But assertion and counter assertion are not the means, are not the kind, are not argument. And democracy depends, liberty depends on argument. Well, so, yes, but I mean, uh, the real thought police, of course, are already in your pocket, and it's it's your Google search engine that is also advertising. And these are transnational phenomena. I don't doubt we're in a period of. Uh, right-wing and nationalist revanchism. But, but, you know, what Orwell dwells on, Adam, so lovingly in his depiction of uh, Airstrip One and Oceania uh, is, is the mechanisms of the party and the totalitarian, the raw totalitarianism expressed very much using the methods of the, the great totalitarian regimes of the past. What he doesn't foresee at all is the creeping totalitarianism of mass consumerism and mass consumption and mass advertising. He just doesn't get that or understand that at all. And while I absolutely accept your argument, I thought you made it very well as a clarion call for us to resist authoritarian and potentially, though not actually yet, totalitarian regimes. That's true. What I'm more concerned about is the creeping one-state totalitarianism that is conditioning you through those little electric pulses. And, and, and that's really clear. But what about Adam Gopnik's point about uh, the war on the past, that Putin and now Trump oh. are engaged in a war on facts, yes. even about the size of the inaugural yes. crowds? That feels very O'Brien, it, and it's happening now. It does feel very O'Brien, and I, I, I agree uh, to some extent, but you have to see that it works in lockstep curiously, with a, with a weird environment in which actually you can say anything you want, but guess what? No one's listening. All right, let's, um, get, let's get some responses from our audience. We've, time is very much marching on, but um, let, we've got somebody there. We're going to take probably two or three. We'll bring it back here. Yeah, we'll go to number four next. Number I, one, yeah. I'm Dr. Anthony Fry. I'm a neuropsychiatrist. I know Zach Busner but I am an ordinary practicing doc and I'm not a celebrity. So for God's sake, try and realize that unfamous people are also have things to say. Very quickly, there's a clear line from being smacked out on the prime minister's jet to Aldous Huxley ordering his LSD as he was dying. And I believe that the future is in brave new world. We've seen nothing, certainly two billion people follow Facebook, but wait till the Google Glasses move one step further and there is a digital wired electrode in your brain. Okay. The people Huxley saw as new humans are nearly with us. Thank I you. predict 20 years to go. Thank you very much. There were, yeah, there were, let's go for the question there, yeah. Adam Gopnik was using the words authoritarianism and totalitarianism uh, interchangeably. And uh, Will Self, I think, was, was somewhat uh, clarifying that, but they are actually quite different things. Uh, totalitarian state that we know of in today's world is North Korea. Russia and the United States are authoritarian states or becoming increasingly so, but they are not totalitarian. Um, Hannah Arendt, who was also an incredible commentator on what was going on in the world at her time and seeing into the future, um, wrote uh, about that quite yeah. extensively. And I think it's you got, Have you got a question for our two students? I, I'm, I think I'm allowed to make a comment to... Uh, well, well, we certainly heard the comment. It was a question I was after. Uh, is, well, do you recognize this, uh, the difference between authoritarianism and totalitarianism? Okay, good. Thank you very much. Let's get a third question. Yeah. Do you believe, uh, Will, that the, the difference is that we haven't become a... In a we are not totalitarianism. We are not this one entity that you can control, but every, there are groups of different people, and therefore to group us as uh, in blocks is, is where Brave New World it, it, it separates us from 1984, where communism has failed, Nazism has failed, all these one person, one value, one way has failed. 
Brave New World says that there are far more ways of manipulating individual groups than okay. us as a whole. Thank you. Let's, let's bring some of these points up. I'll come to there if we get if we have time allows. So to you, Adam, first, this point about the distinction between uh, that, yes, our world certainly has authoritarian regimes, yeah. but 1984 was talking about totalitarianism, and there, with the exception, the question says, right. of North Korea, that's not our world. Right. Well, I have dared to praise Orwell, and I will admit that I have in the past dared to criticize Hannah Arendt as well. I think that that distinction, the distinction that she drew and others have drawn, is made in too schematic a way. The truth is, is that every authoritarian state is a totalitarian state waiting to happen, and totalitarian states very often devolve very quickly back into being authoritarian states. History of the Soviet Union is a good example of that. Uh, and so, try saying that we're merely living in an authoritarian state and not yet a totalitarian one is a bit like saying we have the first signs of eubonic plague, but it hasn't fully developed throughout our system. Uh, it's bad enough to be in an authoritarian condition because it tends to evolve in that direction. Thank you. And to you, we'll have this, oh, there we are, this question that was put over there uh, about uh, the difference between people and whether or not, you know, one of the reasons why communism and other things failed is they didn't recognize the inherent pluralism of people and perhaps Brave New World with its very rigid caste system doesn't reflect the diversity of human beings. Well, I mean, I think the interesting thing about, let's get this straight, I think the, the penetrating quality of Huxley's vision was, yeah, you know, the, the technology he advanced most clearly in, in Brave New World was genetic engineering, but what does it give you? It gives you the equivalent with epsilon, semi-morons and deltas of the kind of automation that's doing you out of jobs now. And what it also, in my view, kind of slightly reflects is the way the internet and the web, in conjunction with multinational corporations and advertisers, can treat people as groups for the purposes of selling and therefore pacifying them. So that is, you know, that, that to me is very redolent of the one state world. And, and if I could just comment on the point about totalitarian versus authoritarian, Everything Adam says is true, and we should certainly guard against a, a, a new totalitarianism, but it's not going to take the form of kind of everybody belonging to a party and everybody. The, the form of totalitarianism that we should be on guard against has already happened. It's already happened. We already have a totalitarian one-state culture, and, and you all know it. So I, I really think I've won. So, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> We'll, we'll know for sure very soon. Let's take another couple of questions, if we can squeeze them in. Yeah. Thank you very much for this debate. I was rather surprised to hear, surprised to hear a discussion of 1984 without mentioning of government surveillance. 1984 is the metaphor for government surveillance around the world, and I think this is where our world falls short, because we're not surrounded by Big Brother, we're surrounded by Big Brothers and sisters and cousins and neighbors. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. Thank you. Great question. Let's hear from somebody there. Um, yeah. Hi. Um, yeah, you, well, we've presented it very much as one versus the other uh, in terms of Brave New World versus 1984, but is it not more the case where, you know, uh, well, sorry, the question is, are, are they necessarily mutually exclusive? A nice message. <laughs> you've, you've anticipated, of course, my very feel-good closing remarks. <laughs> You've, you're, you're getting ahead of ourselves, but that's a very helpful contribution and one which I will return to. Um, do we have one more question hovering? I just want to build on that last question and ask you, if we were to broaden this out beyond our sort of Western current uh, dystopian fears, and I get a lot of that coming from, from yourself, Adam, as well, understandably, and look at China uh, as an example of a potential future um, a major power, very much on the rise, um, I wonder whether we're seeing something there where you might see a 1984 type vision evolving in quite an interesting and rapid way towards uh, some of the content of a brave, brave new world. Um, because that is, the, you know, the, the China or such forces of the future are not going to be um, as we might have imagined previously. Everyone is pushing you two together. I hope you've noticed this. They want this to end in harmony and unity. Let's have a final question here and then we'll have closing remarks. Yeah. At Brave New World and the issue of conditioning, when you look at issues, especially in the states around the Flint water crisis or austerity measures that roll back environmental protections, specifically around lead paint or suitability of children's housing, which we know has a distinct impact on intelligence, are we in some ways uh, instituting the conditioning that Brave New World suggested? 
Okay, thank you. Well, let's put to you, I'm going to reverse the order a little bit here. Surely this point that the question made about surveillance is indeed one of the strongest cases for 1984's prescience. The notion that there is CCTV everywhere, we're constantly surveilled, Orwell got that right. Yeah, but who are we being surveilled by? I mean, the thing is, the back door that was opened by the NSA in cahoots with Google, Microsoft, etc., is, if you think about it, much more to do with consumption than it is to do with surveillance. And actually, the people in the NSA, I mean, sociologists call it professional closure. Their surveillance is really only a concomitant of that commercial surveillance. So, yeah, I think Orwell got it right in some ways that we were going to live, if you like, in a, in a world in which we were permanently surveyed. But I would argue that the purposes of that surveillance is more to make us good little tractable consumers than it is to confirm our ideological purity. And also, if I could just say, the gentleman who mentioned China here, I thought it was very significant, Adam, that you didn't talk about China. And I'd argue that you didn't mention China in your list of authoritarian regimes precisely because of what you're saying. It's mutating into brave new world. Well, why don't you come back on that? And then we're going to have closing remarks okay. on both of you. All right. For, uh, China, I, I failed to mention some more from a slip of the mind than from any particular strategic purpose. I will say China does seem to be uh, mutating from Orwell to Huxley without going through Jefferson and Mill uh, uh, along the way first. Uh, it seems to me, in fact, China is a, is a very frightening example of how it's possible it seems to have a free market without civil freedoms at all. I find that frightening rather than reassuring. Okay. Um, and let me j just very quickly, quickly yeah. to say, where I think Will and I have a genuine and profound disagreement is that the consumerist society with all of its uh, absurdities, oppressions, and homogenization of sensibility turns out to be a very small form of oppression compared to autocratic societies well, with their own... If you're stitching no, trainers in, a, but, in a, a sweatshop in the third world, Adam. Uh, no, absolutely. Yeah. The problem is that when we have the sweatshop in the third world extended into, increasingly, into the first world, that's what we're seeing as, as the wave. And I am here to say, as, as an radicalized American, that however bad you think the empire of the Internet is, the, the empire of the oligarchs is worse. Very good. You, we've got 30 seconds left for each of you before I reveal the result of tonight's vote. 30 seconds of absolute closing, distilled, two-sentence argument for your case for Brave New World and then you for 1984. Why don't you start? I'm not going to make a case for the novel. I've done that already. I'll make a case for Aldous Huxley, a man who battled blindness all his life, who, who went to... To, to live in the States and, and suffer two terrible misfortunes that mean he doesn't have the place that Orwell has in our national consciousness. One is all his books and personal papers were destroyed in a fire two years before he died. So we've never been able to have the kind of love-in on Huxley that goes on with Orwell. So I think he would have a much more salient place in our culture without that fact. The second kick in the, in, the, in the poor man's ass as he departed life was he died on the same day as President Kennedy was assassinated. And so nobody ever paid any attention to it. So let's recover poor old Aldous. Not that we want to diss George, but Aldous needs to be brought forward. Okay. Clo Thank you. Closing, a closing couple of sentences from you, Adam Gottman. Yes, it reminds me of when uh, the great Groucho Marx died on the same day as Elvis, and no one was, was around to, to notice. Let me sp say something about Orwell then. I have never been, a, in the past, an uncritical Orwell fan. Many things that Orwell thought were either wrong or, as I wrote once, how can we praise the clarity of someone with whom everyone agrees? Um, <laughs> the, this seems to me true. Nonetheless, as I tried to say tonight, Orwell had enormous clarity of mind and with it enormous lucidity of thought. And he captured something that's utterly essential and that we'll, we unfortunately are living with now. And that is that the appetite for power in the modern world is not an appetite, is not a warped appetite to give us all pleasure, as Huxley believed, that the appetite for power is in itself a predatory uh, drive that governs the world. That's essential and I have learned from it. Thank you. Thank you.
my, my unscientific suspicion is that quite a lot of people in this room share the sentiment that I think was voiced in a couple of questions, which is to say that both of these books have tremendous things to say and value and insight into the world we live in now. Nevertheless, it has been a competition and a debate, so you want to hear the result. Before you came in, uh, the vote was votes for Brave New World, 35%. Uh, for 1984, 41%, and nearly a quarter, 24% of you were undecided. Well, since then, there is only now 1% of you that are undecided, and I can reveal that 34% still believe 1984 is the book that speaks to us, but a stunning 65% have voted for Brave New World, a swing of 19%. It's the home, the home, uh, it means the winner of tonight's debate is Brave New World by Aldous Huxley and its advocate, Will Self. But I'm sure you're going to want to thank not only Will Self, but also, of course, Adam Gopnik and our tremendous cast of performers, Simon Callow, Tuppence Middleton, George Blagden, and Orlando Seal. Thanks to all of you. Good night.